Okay, Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, we are going to read. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. <clears throat> Here we go. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is a man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham, or to his descendants, that he would be the heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath. But where there is no law, there is no violation. For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather together this morning. Thank you. Um, Lord, we know that there are people uh, who are part of our group who are sick this morning and, and can't be here for various reasons, and so, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for Jan, Lord, who... Um, texted this morning, she's exhausted, she's been taking care of sick family members and she has a lot going on, she wants to be here. Lord, we pray for her health and her safety and that she'd be able to fellowship with us again. Um, Lord, we pray for uh, Trish, uh, who's just uh, fighting and battling health issues and particularly migraines, Lord, and pray that you would just comfort her this morning and Lord, heal her. And Lord, I pray that you deliver her from these migraines. And for Veronica, Lord, who has just been struggling with her health, Lord, we pray that you would bless her, Lord, bring her to full health and strength, and, and, and just uh, open a way for her to be here consistently. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, encourage us this morning in your word and challenge us this morning in your word and, 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 and do what you do with your word, Lord, cleaning us and completing us and rebuking us where we need it, and correcting where we need it, and bringing us to full maturity in Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew 7, verses uh, 13 and 14, Jesus says, um, there are two pathways, and there are two gates. One gate is broad, and the pathway is broad. And Many, most, are on that pathway, Matthew 7, 13, and 14. And that pathway leads to destruction. He says there's another pathway and another gate, and the gate is narrow, and the pathway is narrow, and few find it. And that pathway leads to everlasting life. There's two pathways. You're on one or you're on the other. You're either on the path to destruction with lots of company, or you're on the path to eternal paradise with little company. Paul is identifying two pathways here. 
and they're this, it's the same pathways, but he talks about it in a different kind of language. He talks about it as the way of works or the way of faith. Works or faith. One, the way of works, is the pathway of religiosity. Doing things to please God. The other pathway, the pathway of faith, is marked as a pathway of relationship. It's a pathway that is built on and followed as a relationship. You have religiosity, you have a relationship. One pathway is a pathway of self-will and self-effort. The other is a pathway of surrender. Pathway of works, is self-will and self-effort. Pathway of faith is a pathway of surrender. One is a pathway that says, well, basically, I am my God. I am my own God. And I'm going to be the one that decides how I get to my goal, which is happiness and joy and perhaps everlasting life. But I am my own God. The other pathway, one acknowledges apart from him, I can do nothing. He is all, and I am nothing, and it's all on him, the pathway of faith. The verses that we just read, we see the contrast between works and faith. And Paul started this in, in chapter 3, really in chapter 2, and we've been talking about it all the way along. But this is the contrast between works and faith in its very start. According to the pathway of works, you get what you earn. You get what you earn. The pathway of faith, you are given righteousness. You don't earn righteousness, it's given to you. On the pathway of works, he acknowledges you can boast, you can brag, but you can't do it in front of God. On the pathway of faith, you are forgiven. The pathway of works, faith is made void. On the pathway of faith, grace is active. On the pathway of works, there is no inheritance for you. There is nothing beyond the efforts of this life, and there is no inheritance beyond it. On the pathway of faith, promises are made and kept. On the pathway of works, the destination is wrath. On the pathway of faith, the destination is we inherit all the manifold blessings of glory. Two pathways that Paul is talking about. And obviously a question that everyone must ask is which pathway am I on? Am I on the pathway of works or am I on the pathway of faith? Now Abraham, in verse 2, it says, for if, this is an if clause, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something with which he can boast about, but not before God. So let's break that down. If Abraham was justified, let's just talk for a minute again about justification. We've done multiple times. It's in the passive which means it's something that you receive. Justification is something that you receive from outside of you. It means to be made righteous. It means to be declared righteous, to be cleared of all charges. Now, in our nomenclature of the day, right, when somebody is cleared of charges... They still carry a stigma. They still carry a burden. You're now an ex-con. But you're a con. You're still a con, but you're an ex-con. And you carry that with you all of your life. But in God's world, we who all were convicts at one time when we enter into a relationship with him by grace, through faith, 
we are not ex-cons anymore. We no longer carry that name. We no longer carry that term. We have shed the burden altogether. Not only are we declared righteous, but we are actually functionally made righteous. We are completely transformed. It's not just an exterior outward thing. It's an entirely new person that we become. I am a new person in Christ. The old things are passed away. All things are become new. I am a new person. I'm not an ex-con that carries the burden of being an ex-con anymore. I am a child of God. I am an heir of the, all the blessings that he has for me. Now, this thing, this righteousness that he has made us to be, means that there is a certain standard that's out there. And all who are trying to achieve righteousness, whether by works or by faith, the standard is what? It is the holiness of God. The standard is the holiness of God. Clearly, clearly, in our own strength, we cannot achieve that but people still struggle and try to achieve it. God says in Leviticus 21.8, it's repeated in 1 Thessalonians 4.7, and in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, God says, you be holy, because I am holy. So not just be holy, but be holy like me. Use me as the example. In Romans, in Corinthians, in Ephesus, in Philippi, in Colossae, the letters that Paul wrote to each one of them, he said, to the holy ones who are in these cities. Acknowledging the, uh, the Corinthians, holy ones, they had all kinds of issues going on, but still they're the holy ones. So not only are we declared righteous, but we are in actuality, if we're on the pathway of faith, made righteous. Righteousness is woven into our DNA. We are completely transformed. So if Abraham was justified by works, what does that mean by works? Obviously labor, effort, self-effort, working, doing something, anything that you can to achieve your goal. What are some examples of works that we see in the scriptures? Some examples of works that we see in the scriptures. Some examples of people attempting to earn right standing before God in their own efforts. Um, Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Let's look there real quickly. Romans 3.20. Does works bring us to a place of righteousness? Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be made righteous in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. If we were to turn over to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, there's uh, two or three verses we're going to look at. Galatians 2 verse 16 Galatians 2.16, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified, justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Chapter 3, verse 10, For as many as are the works of the law, for as many as are of the works of the law, are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by some of the things, a few of the things, all of the things written in the book of the law to perform them. And then in verses 23 through 26 of chapter 3 of Galatians, Before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. 
Therefore, the law has become our tutor. This is the purpose of the law. Not to achieve righteousness, but to show us that we cannot achieve righteousness, that there has to be another way. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. During Paul's day, during the early church time, there were two competing religious philosophies that were battling Paul and battling the gospel and battling the church. One was the Judaizers. And Paul had a, everywhere he went, he was battling the Judaizers. The Judaizers were continually trying to impose on the, on the Gentile believers, the law as a condition of their salvation. You can't just believe. You can't just surrender. You got to do these things. You got to be circumcised. You've got to obey the law. And then you will be right before God. The Judaizers were a constant irritant to the life of the early church. There was another group, and this came out of the pagan culture. So we had this the Judaizers, Judaizers coming out of the Jewish culture. Then we had another group coming out of the pagan culture that was also imposing or trying to impose a works-oriented gospel on the church. They were known as the Gnostics. You, many of you have heard that term. Gnostic is a Greek word for knowledge. We have special knowledge. John alludes to the Gnostics in 2 John 1, 7, and also 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, where he says, anyone, and we often hear this and read this, and we're like, what is he talking about? Anyone who does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is of the devil. Here's what the Gnostics believed and taught. This was based on Greek philosophy, going all the way back to Plato. Material things are evil. Only spiritual things are good. Therefore, Christ could never have come in the flesh, because the flesh is evil. And it's all spiritualized. The gospel is spiritualized. So we have the Judaizers, who were trying to synchronize the gospel with the legalism of the law, and we had the pagan philosophers who were trying to synchronize the gospel with their pagan philosophies. And how would it work out with the pagans? If matter is evil and only spirit is good, then I gotta do something about this flesh. This flesh is going to not allow me to be right with God. So they begin and it led to many bizarre practices of self-denial and self-abuse to gain favor with God. Again, works to gain favor, and this time it's self-denial and self-abuse. And further, it claimed that we have, because of this, we have a higher knowledge, it's extra-biblical knowledge, as they are practicing these things. So, whether it's the Judaizers or whether it's the Greek and the pagans, all are attempting to gain eternal life in their own efforts and believing that to be the case. But if we go all the way back to the beginning, we see it began there. After the temptation, after the fall, Adam and Eve looked at each other and they realized they were naked and they were ashamed and they were trying to hide from God. And what did they do to cover their shame, to try to mitigate the sin that they had committed, to try to reestablish somehow a right relationship with God. 
they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves, to cover their shame, to protect themselves. And after God dispensed the consequences of the fall, he took them and he said, I'm putting words in God's mouth now, but this will never do. This is what I must do for your sin to be covered. And he killed an animal and he made out of that animal clothes and he clothed them with the animal that he had to kill. So for their shame to be covered, God had to do the work and God had to kill something and, God, and blood had to be shed and their shame could be covered. It didn't work in their own efforts, you see. In Genesis chapter 4, we have the story of Cain and Abel. And we have Abel, who takes the lesson of the animal that needed to be killed to be a proper sacrifice before God Almighty, and he sacrifices one of his sheep. And then we have Cain. And it talks about this in Jude verse 11. It calls it the way of Cain. The false teachers in Jude 11 who take the way of Cain. Cain, who was a farmer, took his own efforts, his own, uh, this is what I'm doing, and if this isn't good enough for God, well, that's too bad, because this is what I have done. And he takes his own efforts and he presents them to God, and God is not happy. He's not pleased with Cain's self-efforts at being right with him. And we know the rest of the story. God says, hey, why are you so mad? You've got to be careful. Sin is crouching at your door and wants to dominate you. And the next morning, Cain got up and he went out and killed his brother. Trying to get right with God, trying to draw into a relationship with God based on our own efforts. Um, we have another story. This is, uh, I think many of you are familiar with it, of trying to please God in our own efforts. And this one you're going to go, hmm, wait a minute. Well, you heard of Nabad, Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu were the two eldest sons of Aaron. And so they were in the line of the being the high priest. They were in the priestly line. So in... Uh, Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 and 9, they are part of the group of 70, and Aaron and Moses, who have an encounter with God in his glory. You can read about that in Exodus 24, verses 1 and 9. Nadab and Abihu are part of that group. They see God in his glory, and it's amazing. In Leviticus chapter 9, verse 24, they are present when the tabernacle has been completed, the bronze altar is in place. There's an offering on the bronze altar and they are present when fire comes out from the Lord and consumes the offering that's on the altar. And so the fire on the bronze altar is kindled. And according to Leviticus chapter 6, verses 8 through 13, it is never to go out. The fire that consumes the offerings that men bring to them, him is brought by God Almighty and it is never to go out. And they are to take from the coals of that fire which God himself kindled and put that fire into their bowls with incense and it's that bowl with the fire that God kindled that they take into the Holy of Holies and present to the mercy seat where God is when they are sacrificing for the people of Israel. So it was, you, you cannot overemphasize the, the, the importance of doing God's things in God's way and not your way. So Nadab and Abihu in um, Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, they're like, let's make our own fire. Let's just kindle our own flame. And let's put, it's, you know, we got to maybe go through some rituals or what, I don't know what they were thinking, but it says that they kindled their own flame. They made their own fire, put it in the bowl, 
put the incense in, and then we're going to go present it to God at the mercy seat, and God, fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Do not do God's things in your own way. Do not try to please God in your own way. Don't be presumptuous. Do God's things God's way. One more example. 1 Chronicles 13.10 The Ark of the Covenant is being returned during the time of uh, King Saul. It had been taken by the Philistines and we can read about that in 1 uh, Samuel and um, no, it was before that. No, it was, sorry, it was before that. It was, during, it was when Samuel was a kid and, and the Ark was taken by the Philistines. There was a battle. The ark was taken by the Philistines. And, and uh, the priest, Eli, when he heard about it, fell over dead. And then, um, you know, all kinds of ramifications. So now the ark is with the Philist Philistines, and it was with the Philistines for decades. Saul, for 40 years, was king. It was with them all that time. When David became king, he said, it's time to bring it back. And they, and they wanted it. They wanted it. The Philistines had had it gone through all kinds of plagues and terrible things. And they finally, it ended up at the house of an Israelite and it was just there. So David said, we need to bring it back to Jerusalem. We need to set up our worship the way it should be. And so as the ark is sitting on a cart that is being pulled by oxen on its way back up to Jerusalem and there's people all around it and David's out front. He's, there's, the bands are playing and he's dancing before the Lord and it's all exciting and it's happening, and, and um, there's a, a rocky place in the road and maybe some potholes, and, and the cart shakes a little bit, and a, a man just named Uzzah just reaches out to steady the ark. Dead. He was doing God's things his way. It had been clear from the beginning how sacred that was and how it needed to be handled. And he just casually, oh, reached out and touched the ark and God killed him. We must do God's things, God's way, not by our own efforts, not by our own works, not by our own way. It is man's continual bent, his continual bent to make his own way to do his own thing, to try to save himself, to in essence become his own shot caller, which in essence is saying, I'm my own God. This is the bent of mankind since the garden. Okay, so Abraham, if he could be justified by works, this is what we've been talking about, by his own efforts, this is what we've been talking about, Paul saying, you know, come on, this is just impossible, but if he could be justified by his own works, but guess what? Not before God. Not before God. If he could be justified by his own works, he maybe has something to boast about until he looks at the face of God. And then all boasting ceases. Because where it says, if he could be justified by his own works, he has grounds to boast, that word for um, he has grounds to boast except before God, that word before, again, it's the same uh, proposition that is in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word was with God, and the word was God. That word with is the preposition pros, the Greek preposition. There's many Greek prepositions, remember? It could, it could have been a preposition that was beside God or behind God or in some form or fashion relate, but it's pros, which is the word face. So John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, meaning Jesus, the word, was face to face with God in the beginning, and he was God. Here it's the same preposition, pros. So, 
if Abraham or any of us think that we can be justified by our own works, well, we have something to boast about until we're face to face with God, until we see him face to face. And then all boasting ceases. Why? First off, that word for boast, it literally means neck. So it means lifting your head up. Look at me. Look at me. Just raising your own head up. And it's interesting because there is a right boasting and there's a wrong boasting. Let me tell you what the right boasting is. It's always okay to boast in the Lord. It's never okay to boast in yourself. There's a right boasting and a wrong boasting. One of the reasons that one of the reasons that works, a works-oriented way to be right with God, one of the reasons it's so appealing to people, and it has been for 6,000 years, besides the fact that it makes you feel good about yourself, possibly, it's self-satisfying, is because we always grade ourselves on a curve. We forget, or we don't look at God, we just look at each other. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I'm not perfect, but I'm no Hitler. I mean, there's always somebody below you that'll make you feel better about yourself. Always, no matter what you've done. <clears throat> Hitler might have said, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm not Attila the Hun. I don't know. Could have, you could have come, I'm not the devil. <clears throat> we, we don't feel and look so bad when we're compared to so-and-so except before God. It's not a grade on a curve. It's, you know, it's kind of like this. Because in a spiritual sense, we, we see ourselves um, on this horizontal level and we don't see clearly, we don't understand clearly, we don't see ourselves as spiritual beings, we just see what we see. But in the heavenlies, and from God's perspective, and pr from the perspective of the holy angels, <clears throat> when they see us, what does the scripture say? What does Romans chapter 3 say? There's none that does good. There's none that seeks after me. They've all together gone their own way. In Ephesians chapter 2, you are all children of wrath. You are all under the power of the devil. You are all disobedient. You are all filthy. All of your righteousnesses that you think you have are to him as filthy rags. We're all filthy outside of him. And yet here's all of these filthy people wrestling around in the slime and the mud of this filthy, sinful planet striving to, to raise their head up, to get above the others, striving to look better and to feel better about themselves, striving to achieve, striving to achieve um, a relationship with God or, or some goal or destiny. And, and, and it's a bunch of, as it were, spiritually dead corpses with animated bodies just flailing around and wrestling each, uh, with each other and, and just filthy. That's what we look like. And perchance someone manages to raise himself up just a little bit above the others and he looks about and he says, I've arrived. I've achieved my goals. But if in that condition he could actually and this is what happens. See the face of God. <clears throat> and when he sees the faith, face of God, he or she knows, oh, I am nowhere near. I am, I am lost. I am broken. I am defeated. And as they see the face of God, and then look in the mirror of truth, which is in his word, and see themselves 
And don't forget, that's when that one cries out to God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize I have nothing and I can do nothing to fix this. I am a mess. I am helpless and I am hopeless. And the moment has already begun. The breath of God has already begun to blow when that realization happens. It happened to the thief on the cross. Cursing at the Son of God and at the same time realizing I'm filthy and He is not. I'm spiritually dead and even though He's dying, He's alive. And so in the midst of Him cursing, He stops. He has seen the face of God. He has seen Himself. And He says, remember me. And Jesus does. Or in Luke chapter 18, the parable that Jesus tells, verses 9 through 14, there were two men that went to the temple. A Pharisee and a tax collector, a sinner. And the Pharisee stood there and said, Oh God, I thank you that I am all of that. I thank you that I'm not like him. You and I, we've got it going on, God. I give to the poor. I do all these things. I thank you. And that poor, wretched sinner who saw himself for what he really was, filthy and helpless and hopeless, he had already seen the mirror of truth. He had already gazed in the face of God. And at that point, he can't look up anymore. And he's bowing in his face before the Lord. And he says, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says to his disciples, which one of those went away righteous? Of course, only the one that appeals to God and says, I can't do it. You have to do it. Save me. Every time in the Gospels and in the, and in the book of Acts and in the letters, every time someone comes to that point of seeing God for who He is and seeing who they are through the eyes and the lens of Scripture, they say, what must I do to be saved? And what do they say every time? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. They don't say, go do this and go do that and go do this and you got to go. No, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then the transformation, the glorious transformation takes place. And God has breathed life into their soul. And their hearts are kindled. And their faith flames up. And they are transformed. They are raised up out of the muck and the mire. And they are washed clean. And they are robed in the righteousness of Christ. And they are called his sons and his daughters and priests and kings and inheritors of all the promises and glories of heaven. Works or faith? Works or faith? Works are not a precursor to faith. Works are a product of faith. R.C. Sproul says it this way, and I love this. And this is the truth. Almost <laughs> every theological error, all of these work-oriented doctrines, almost every theological error can be boiled down to one of these two mistakes, and usually it's both. They're not thinking of God as highly as they ought to think, and they're thinking of themselves too highly than they ought. I can save myself. I don't really need God. A diminished God, a view of God, and an exalted view of self results in wrath. 
an exalted view of God and a diminished view of self, a true view of self, will result in salvation and everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, I'm preaching to the choir. I know it. I'm preaching to the choir and it's an encouragement to me and it's an encouragement to all of us. And Lord, as we go out from here and as we share the good news of Christ, I pray that you would just enable and empower us to be able to communicate the horror of sin and the horror that awaits because of sin and and that we are all sinners condemned to eternity, separated from you, and yet you provided the way. And it's through you that we can receive the inheritance that awaits us. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you. Give us the grace to go out and to, to share the good news and to see others transformed by the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.